I've often considered this a birthright of mine, uh, being a TED, I feel like I should get the right to have a TED talk. And so, here I am tonight, I want to talk to you about uh, why I believe spacesuit gloves hold the key to the future of humanity. Uh, what you're looking at is uh, NASA's current flight-ready uh, spacesuit glove. This is the pressure garment. Uh, they call this the ILC Phase 6 glove. Uh, the Phase 6 because it's been through six iterations since the start of the shuttle EMU program. Um, ILC being uh, the International Latex Corporation in uh, Dover, Delaware. Uh, it's a very complicated glove. There's a lot happening as far as sizing goes. Um, and uh, it's uh, been through quite a, quite a few number of um, iterations, partly because spacesuit gloves end up being a, a really a major limiting factor for astronauts working outside of the vehicle. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, this is essentially the Russian equivalent. Uh, you see the inside of this glove. The uh, TMG, or thermal micrometeorite garment, is uh, taken up over the fingers. Uh, this is the Orlon glove. Uh, again, you're looking at the pressure garment side of it. Both very uh, highly engineered garments and uh, still under, uh, under a great deal of scrutiny. Uh, so why do I care about spacesuit gloves? Well, for me, it happened with an injury uh, way back uh, when I was graduating from high school in 1996. Um, I broke my scaphoid, which is that lower right-hand bone in the wrist. Uh, it actually interacts with uh, your radius and allows you to move your wrist. Uh, it was a pretty major break. You can see I had some pins put in, I had a bone graft, and I ended up out of commission for about a year uh, in my left, left arm. Uh, it was really devastating to me because I was going to college as a French horn uh, performance major, playing classical music, uh, and French horn, of course, is a left-handed instrument, so it essentially meant that I could not play for about a year. Um, and uh, it means that I'm not a classical musician today, which I'm actually very thankful for. I, uh, <laughs> This is a, an injury that has led to a lot of great things in my life. So, um, One thing it did was really help me define what the human hand was. And at the risk of spouting truisms to you, I'd like to go ahead and sort of define for me what the human hand is. And uh, you know, maybe the simplest way we could say it is it's five rays that come out of our arm. Um, one of these rays ends up being very important. Our thumb uh, essentially moves backwards. Uh, against the rest of our fingers and allows us something called perfect opposition. Uh, it's an evolutionary advantage that we have over the other creatures of the earth and uh, it's gotten, a little bit, gotten us in a little bit of trouble, of course, but uh, uh, it allows us to manipulate objects very precisely. Um, and uh, some have argued even that this uh, mechanism allows us to um, has, has driven our brain much larger because we're able to manipulate these objects so well. Uh, it required our brain to get larger and uh, perhaps uh, drive us to language. Um, but of course, if we start defining the hand, it's a lot more than just five rays uh, coming up above our wrist. Uh, most of the muscles of the human hand come actually from our forearm. Um, only the intrinsic muscles in our hand which allow for add and abduction of our fingers are actually inside the hand. Um, and really when we start defining it, a lot of what happens with the hand is part of uh, what happens up in our brain. And uh, uh, perhaps the most illustrative example of this is the, uh, playing the piano. Um, for musicians, hands end up being very important, and so this is an obvious illustration for me, but uh, the piano is a, obviously a very um, demanding instrument. Uh, you end up playing with each finger, um, very precise, uh, different movements, and um, it, it, uh, a terrific illustration, if you can move to the next slide, is actually a, a Nikolai Bernstein, a uh, neuroscientist from the 60s, put it a lot better than I could. He said, the cerebral motor area, our brain, right, organizes responses by deftly adjusting and balancing between resultant external forces, that is, uh, perhaps the manual of the keyboard, and the manifestation of inertia, constantly reacting to proprioceptive si signals, that is, maybe the music that the piano player is listening to, or reading, rather, 
and simultaneously integrating impulses from separate subsystems, perhaps the drummer that the piano player is playing with, so that 10 successive repetitions of the same movement demand 10 successive impulses, all different from each other. And that's really something to think about if we know how the human brain works. Uh, it ends up being sort of a funnel of, uh, of, of impulses uh, sent out to the body. And so all 10 different impulses coming from the brain all at once is really sort of an amazing, um, amazing thing that's happening. And we can really see that when we look at uh, this famous chart called homunculus. This is a diagram of the human brain. You see the left and the right globe, or a lobe rather, and uh, it's, it's sort of showing about how much area inside the brain is actually dedicated to different parts of the body. And we see the legs and torso take up about as much space as the hand itself. And each finger could maybe represent um, or give, is given a, a, approximately the same amount of area as a limb. And this ends up being a really sort of useful way to think about the hand as a little body on the end of our hand itself. Um, and so, moving on, um, the hand is a lot more than just um, its ability to function on our body. The hand in our culture obviously has a lot of uh, meaning. What we do with our hands says a lot about who we are and uh, what we intend to, uh, to say to the rest of the world, and whether it's aggressive or celebratory, right? Or pious, right? Uh, however we put our hands ends up being a very descriptive aspect of uh, who we are as people, right? Um, and indeed, what we're able to do with our hands defines us as people. Uh, the specific skills that we have uh, are manifest through our hands, whether it's a doctor or somebody who operates a computer or a sewer. Um, our ability to use our hands in very specific ways ends up defining us as people in our culture. Uh, and this led me to look a lot at um, how hands have been remade in, uh, throughout time and, and certainly specifically for amputees, prosthetics end up being a really interesting way to help define hands. Um, and for me, the, the most fascinating thing is how inadequate they are. Prosthetics almost never, and I will go ahead and say never, are able to actually uh, reproduce the full range of motion of the human body. And some of these are sort of laughably um, uh, inadequate, almost like mannequins. Uh, there are, um, uh, this would be the ideal, right, as uh, Luke Skywalker in uh, Star Wars able to, uh, to add on the perfect uh, prosthetic robotic hand that uh, is seamless with the rest of the body. Um, and we're getting there. There's a, there. This is a shadow robotic hand, a commercially available robotic hand that has a great deal of uh, range of motion and is adequately uh, able to reproduce range of motion with the human hand. Perhaps for me the most impressive part of this is the movement of this fourth metacarpal, the ability of the, um, this robotic hand to actually cup, uh, is a, a huge step forward for uh, mechanical uh, reproduction of the human hand. Uh, but it's not quite there. And of course, for a prosthetic to actually work like this, we would need uh, motor, uh, motor connections that uh, would feed directly into the brain. We're just not quite there yet. Um, also, the hand is a huge part of art, and uh, it really got me thinking about reproducing the hand in different ways. Um, the hands have been sort of the obsession of many different artists, uh, Michelangelo, obviously, Durer, uh, Rodin here, um, produced hands throughout his career. Some of them are grotesque in their size, but he was uh, obviously quite obsessed with them. And uh, Louis Bourgeois, this is a, a shot from the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Museum that really speaks to me as far as um, the hands being an output from the brain to represent things in, in the body. And uh, so I, uh, I followed suit and I started building hands myself. Uh, this is one of the first hands that I actually put together. It's a sort of a hand cage that allowed a little protection for me uh, to stick my hand inside. I also started reproducing hands uh, from inside out. I cut the bones out and laid out ligaments according to anatomical charts to try to understand exactly the structure of hands and how, why, and how exactly they moved. 
Um, I was also fortunate enough to work with uh, Martin Esquerdo Studios uh, to work on some costumes. This was for the National Opera. These are um, some hand extensions for Giants in a Wagner opera. They're spring-loaded open and um, uh, closed with, uh, with the actual movement of the hand. Um, and then I started moving on to uh, this idea of extending the ability of the human body. This is a drill hand with the motor mounted up towards the top and a drill chuck coming out of the finger, really trying to extend this idea of a, of a prosthetic into something that could really uh, uh, benefit the human body beyond what we designed for. And that led me to, um, I, I read in Popular Mechanics about something called the Astronaut Glove Challenge, which happened back in 2007. Um, NASA has uh, had, for a long time, issues with their uh, astronaut gloves. Um, they're uh, very high torque, and astronauts end up need, needing to train for a long time to uh, develop hand muscles that are able to deal with uh, the high strain that they experience in spacewalks. So NASA started one of these citizen inventor challenges, sort of like the X Prizes, to, um, to uh, help develop uh, extremely low torque hands, uh, or rather, astronaut gloves. Um, I didn't place in that competition back in 2007, but I learned a lot, and uh, I got to build a vacuum chamber glove box, which is what you see in the back of the room here. And I also met uh, a lot of really important people, including uh, Gary Harris, who was a man for me who wrote the book on spacesuits, and uh, Nikolai Moiseev, who's here in the audience tonight. Um, Nick and I ended up joining forces. Here's Nikolai in 2007. This is actually the inside, uh, the bladder portion of the ILC Phase 6 glove that we saw back at the beginning. Um, Nick worked for Zvezda, the Russian space agency, for a long time as a spacesuit designer, and he and I joined forces in 2009. Uh, you can see here a prototype finger that we worked on, um, going through working with different materials. Uh, this ended up being a really handy way to prototype pressurized gloves. Rather than making the entire glove, we would work on a finger at a time. Um, and here you see the glove that we used in, back in 2009, and uh, it's really, here's an, a, a really great illustration for me of the difference between an unpressurized pressurized glove and a pressurized glove. Uh, it's uh, not much to look at when, you, when it's not full of air, but uh, once you pressurize it, you realize what these uh, purposes here. You can actually see the TMG that's indexed to that, the thermal micrometeorite garment that would go over this pressurized glove. Uh, here's an uh, example of what exactly happened at this glove competition. It was uh, the idea is that we wanted to outperform NASA's current technology under pressure, and uh, what we were really going for is low torque. So they would set up the glove, pressurize it, and here they would measure how much torque it took to add or abduct the glove. Uh, that was the wrist section. This is add and abduction. They also tested flexion and extension, and then finger flexion and extension. And there was a great deal of, um, of uh, dexterity tests in NASA's glove box, a real souped out machine that had uh, hydraulic shocks that would raise and lower to the height of the user, and uh, offset uh, shoulder bearings. Um, uh, and it was a great competition. We were really excited to be there. Uh, we got a lot of support from NASA. I got to meet Charlie Walden, went down to Washington, D.C. We got to go to Houston uh, back in April this year and uh, meet, uh, for me, the uh, sort of American hero of a spacesuit design, uh, Joe Cosmo. I swear that's his name. Uh, he's uh, been making spacesuits since back during the Apollo era. Uh, and uh, so, of course, I care about spacesuit gloves. I've had some success in this, but uh, why does this matter? Well, part of it is the human hand. And I think I've tried to illustrate to you how important the hand is in being human and functioning as a human being. Um, of course, a lot of people think that uh, humans are destined for the stars. Stephen Hawking says the uh, finite natural resources that the Earth provides in our genetic code, which carries selfish and aggressive instincts, for Earth, means that our only chance for long-term survival is to spread out into space. And of course, you might expect Stephen Hawking to say something like that, being an astrophysicist, of course, he thinks we're destined for the stars. But a very different thinker, William Burroughs, says something almost to the same line. He says, man is an artifact designed for space travel. He's not designed to remain in his present biologic state any more than a tadpole is designed to remain a tadpole. Um, so we're going to the stars whether we like it or not. Just ask William Burroughs. Um, of course, 
we're going to need a lot of things to get there. We'll need a low cost to orbit, we'll need uh, ability to adapt to some very strange environments, but most of all, in my opinion, we'll, we're going to need to be able to use our hands. And there's a lot of other people who feel the same way. Phil Spampanato, who's the head of uh, space systems at ILC Dover, the uh, company that makes pressurized garments, says, if an astronaut cannot use his or her hands adequately in a pressurized suit, there's simply no reason to send them into space. And I, I truly believe that. Uh, uh, just in conclusion, I want to uh, give a picture of NASA's current EMU suit and uh, sort of illustrate why I think the gloves are so important. Um, what is it that this person is doing in space? Well, they're there to work on objects, right? And part of, and maybe the most important part of that, is their head. What they're able to um, see and hear and taste and touch, or taste and smell, uh, is very important. Uh, inside a spacesuit, you can't hear much at all because of the vacuum of space, other than what you hear through commands and communication with uh, Houston or, or Moscow or wherever it might be. Um, you're not, smell, you're not there to smell, certainly, and in fact, I think a lot of astronauts wish they couldn't smell inside the EMU, uh, and certainly not there to taste. So a lot of what happens in the head is just visual, uh, and it's limited, because you're looking through a visor, of course, uh, it uh, distorts your vision. In space, uh, the, your, the human body is not designed to see uh, in space, and we're used to the atmosphere that, around us, so it ends up being a really difficult place to see, requiring uh, various visors. And in fact, I would argue that our eyes in space are obsolete. Uh, robotic um, uh, cameras are able to see through a great, great number of spectrums, uh, can magnify objects, can see wider range of motion without distortion than the human eyes. And so, for me, this whole suit is a, is a way to move the hand around. Uh, and if we're not able to adequately use that hand, then it's almost pointless to send us up there in the first place. So thank you very much.